Welcome to the Local Domination Podcast, your ultimate guide to get local clients fast. Featuring interviews with local marketing and lead generation experts who will show you exactly how to attract local clients and dominate your market. And now, here's your host, Doran Aldana. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Local Domination Podcast, your ultimate guide to get local clients fast. I'm your host, Doran Aldana, and today is certainly a special day for the podcast because we have a very special guest expert, Patrick Lilly. This dude is the real deal on steroids. Let me just give you a little bit of the background on him before we get started. Uh, he is Manhattan-based. And he is a real estate broker extraordinaire. His name is Patrick Lilly, a 25-year veteran of New York City real estate and founder of the Patrick Lilly team, which he has consistently led to the Wall Street Journal top 250 list, which is extraordinary to say the least. Among the high-profile recognition he has received for his work is a featured spot in the Billionaire Dollar Agent by Steve Cantor. Uh, Patrick is also a star with Alex Sharfin's Star Power Systems, a frequent speaker at conferences and seminars, and an accredited accredited business and life coach with the International Coach Federation, otherwise known as IFC. Additionally, Patrick is the host of the popular podcast Real Estate Success Rocks, which I love that name. That's a killer name. And he's also the host of the annual conference of the exact same name, which draws 400 to 500 plus of the nation's top rainmaker and luxury agents. I'm not going to have any further ado. I could keep going, but you get the idea. He is the real deal. The one and only Patrick Lilly. Thank you so much, Patrick, for being with us today. Hey, Doran, it's good to be here. You know what? I listened to that. That sounds pretty impressive. I don't think of it that way, but it does. <laughs> I hear it coming from somebody else's mouth. Yeah, well, after me talking about it, you can hardly wait to hear what you have to say, right? Exactly. I actually <laughs> want to know what I want to say. <laughs> well, cool. Well, why don't we just start off with uh, giving a little bit about your story, how you got into the real estate game, and how you got into breaking into this uber competitive market with New York luxury real estate. I'm very curious to know how you meandered through your journey to get to that place. Give us the quick synopsis. Well, you know how people like say, when I grow up, I want to be a fireman or I want to be an astronaut. Nobody right. ever grows up saying I want to be a real estate broker. Not, right. anybody, not anybody that I know of does. Yeah, you'd have to have a few loose connections for that, right? Yeah, maybe if you're, you know, you know, if you're the the son or daughter of, of Donald Trump, maybe. <laughs> right. For the rest of us, the answer is, is that's not the case. I was getting my MBA at NYU and bartending at the same time. And I actually thought I was going to go into advertising. And I did my internship with a big firm here in New York. And uh, then I went for job interviews. And the highest job offer I got was $23,000. This was back in the uh, early 80s, and uh, one of the job offers I got was 18000 and I was bartending at the time, making, you know, sixty, seventy, five thousand dollars $75,000 in cash, mm -hmm. and there was no way I was going to leave that money for $18,000, so I just didn't know what I was going to do. And about a year later, a, uh, a friend of mine I had lunch with who's in real estate, he says, why don't you come work for us? And I turned up my nose and I said, I have an MBA from NYU and I'm not selling apartments. And he told me how much money he made his first year. And my nose went right back down and <laughs> right. three days later. And the fact of the matter is, is I got really lucky. I got into something that I'm really good at. And, um, you know, it took me a while to realize that that was going to be my career path. I thought this was just a stepping stone that I'd probably, you know, because I was too highly educated for residential real estate. And then I finally realized at some point, no, this is really what I'm doing. So I've, I've been going at it full blast now for quite a while. Wow. So how did you get into the luxury market? Because a lot of times people will get into real estate or any, uh, you know, service for that matter. 
and there's this upper crust of clientele that are, you know, are super affluent. They've got different lingo. They've got an air of success about them. And for a lot of people that intimidates them and most people shy away from that. But obviously you saw uh, a unique, unique opportunity there and you jumped right to it and you made it happen. So how did, how did that happen? How did you penetrate that market? Cause I know it's super, super competitive, especially in NYC. It is super competitive. I guess one of the main beliefs that I've always had is, you know, we all put on our, our pants, our underpants, one leg at a time, and that the wealthy and the, and the famous may uh, uh, expect different things from the normal person, but they're basically the same as us. And, um, uh, you know, it took a while. When I was at the beginning, all of my friends were cheap-ass friends, and none of them could afford anything. So I pretty much had to build up my own network. So for, for many years, I was just selling what would be considered normal properties in New York. And I realized, you know, each time I sold a higher end listing, uh, the profit on that was so much better than on a, on a regular listing that I wanted to try to focus on it. And the way that I really built it up was twofold, was one, going after expired listings. So an expired listing is a listing that had been listed with another broker and they did not sell that home and uh, the listing agreement had expired. So they most likely will probably want to list with another broker. So I, I went after that. And what's so great about that is because of those leads, I could, I could go after at the beginning. I only went after leads over a million dollars that are expired. Now I only go after leads that are over three millions that are expired because mm -hmm. it's use of my time. And then I was able to build up, um, a, a, a level of business now that I look like, you know, I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. and, the, and when you're dealing with luxury clients, they, especially sellers, they want to list with other people who have sold like properties. So once you get the first couple of listing, it's a lot easier. So there was a while that I broke into the $3 million market. Then I broke into the $5 million market. And then I broke into the $8 million market. And finally, you know, I, I just did a deal this year at $14.5 million. And in order to do that, um, I, had the, I had the lead on a, on a, on a high-end property. Um, and I knew that they were going to give it to me just because I, the highest sales price I'd ever done was, was around $8 million. So I partnered up with a, a woman who I like very much in our firm who, who has handled that price point regularly, and we split it 50-50. So we ended up going to contract, and that was awesome. But the fact of the matter is, is from that listing, I have now gotten two $25 million properties because I was willing to forego half of the commission in order to look long term. Does that make sense? Smart. I love it. Yeah. So in other words, if you don't have the knowledge, partner up with someone who does. Right, leverage their expertise, leverage their clout, leverage their trust factor, and uh, that way, once you get that success under your belt, now you have that credibility, right? And now you can go out and start getting more of the same high-level, big-ticket type of clientele. Is that the absolutely. big idea? And that's absolutely. And, and I did have the I did have the knowledge to do it. I just didn't have the track record. Right. And it's the track record that that it, I'm willing to give up 50% on so that I can have that track record down the road. Love it. I call that borrowed credibility. That's a good right? term. So whatever commission that you gave up, you conceded for that partnership initially, it was well worth that in the long run. I'm sure you'd agree <laughs> for that borrowed credibility. So now when $6 million listings are looking <clears throat> to, to list, and they see that I carry much higher listings now, it's so much easier to land that $6 million listing. And if I'm hearing you right, you started out at the bottom with just yeah, average? My average, my average sales price when I started was 150000 Right, and my hunch is the amount of time, energy, and money that it took to acquire and service that type of level of client it's probably the same, if not maybe a little less than doing a transaction 10 times, 20 times the size. Is that accurate? I would say 
if anything, it's the same or less time is required for a higher transaction because they're more sophisticated buyers. They, they bought and sold many more properties and consequently they don't have to have their hand held on learning what the process is about that you'd have to do with a lower end property. Right. So you got a client who's already pre-educated. They're already kind of pre-cooked and pre-tenderized, if you will. And so we've removed a lot of that razor wire. We've greased the chute because they were already uh, pre cooked and then all we're doing now is making 10 times more for the same amount of time energy and effort is that the idea let me i agree the only difference is and there is a big difference is their expectations on service are a, a lot different from the expectations of a first time buyer and so no matter what field you're in if you're trying to up Let's say you had a retail store and you're trying to up your game to higher priced items. It comes down to the fact that they expect a higher level of attention. And there's almost, I hate to use this word, there's a sense of entitlement often right. that comes with the wealthy. And you need to recognize that and make sure that they're being serviced the way that they want to be serviced, not the way that you would normally do something. Right. But I mean, if you're getting paid 10, 20 times more than you would with a normal average client, you're you're naturally more motivated to serve at a higher level anyways, aren't you? You bet your bottom dollar. <laughs> right. So it's not like someone's got to push a soggy noodle up a hill. You've already got that internal impetus, that internal motivation, uh, because you want to delight them. You want to knock their socks off. You want to wow them. They're, they're You're getting paid 10 to 20 times more. So, I mean, naturally, you got some pep in your step. you got a sparkle in your eye. You want to show up and perform, right? Sure. And where are you from? I'm from beautiful Kamloops, British Columbia, Canada. God's oh, country. I love British Columbia. <laughs> and is that a common saying, push a noodle up a hill? No, that's just my own weird Doranese. <laughs> You'll get used to it. Don't worry. <laughs> I like visual metaphors, so <laughs> I, I, that caught my attention. And it's not just a noodle. It's a soggy noodle, by the way. Oh, right. <laughs> it's not as effective as it's not as Right. Effective. Exactly. You got to make sure you get that in there. So tell us about this paradigm shift from going from the standard lead generation where you're getting a lead uh, through online or you're getting a lead through purchase leads, you're getting a lead through Zillow or whatever it might be, and you're shifting to this thing called relationship building. Tell us about the distinction in that paradigm shift and what difference does it make in terms of local domination in general and profitability in particular? All right. Well, it's interesting that you're hitting on both of those items. Uh, um, I have found that chasing leads, which is what so much of lead generation is, is chasing leads is both costly and in terms of dollars and in terms of time spent. And what I've learned over the years is that developing relationships with individuals and just making them so thrilled about the quality of the work that I give them that I don't have to spend the money on lead generation anymore. And then they send a referral that I do not have to fight for mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I'm doing such a, a great job. So the majority of my business is referral based now. And, and I know as you get longer in the business that, that that happens before. But, you know, one of the other things, in addition to the extra amount of money you make and, and lesser cost is my happiness level goes way, way, way up. Because now I'm coming in as the trusted advisor versus somebody I'm trying to convince to work with me. Mm -hmm. And it's two totally different uh, relationships. And trust me, the trusted advisor is so much more um, enjoyable and less, uh, uh, less combative. Wow, well there's a lot of nectar you just shared there. One is there's a prerequisite to referrals. You don't just get referrals because you show up and breathe and you can fog a mirror, you right? I mean, you actually have to do some something to wow them. You push a soggy noodle up a hill. I'm a door and I want to get to meet you one of these things. <laughs> well, 
there's always there's always an option and there's always the opportunity if the price is right brother <laughs> i'm just playing with you so yeah, well, then maybe 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 we'll pass that Go ahead. <laughs> you, you weren't that excited you, you were excited until i talked about that right so uh that's okay we'll talk about a payment plan later it's all good brother okay, um, no so wow factor wow factor is the prerequisite to referrals is what i'm hearing from you in other words you got to orchestrate engineer your business to not just meet expectations but exceed them is that right yes and to always hold that client's best interest at heart not your best interest in the short term because looking long term uh, is about maintaining relationships so that they never doubt that you don't have their best interest at heart. You know, when, when you're dealing with the wealthy, for example, everybody's always coming after them for something. They want, everybody wants a piece of their little bank account or mm -hmm. Right. And, and it's, it's gotta be really difficult to always people wanting something from you. You've gotta feel like a little paranoid, I would think. And, and if you can show and you can demonstrate to them that that's not the case with you over time, then the the trust level increases dramatically. So I have learned a long time ago that that when somebody asks me my opinion about something, let's say they want to do something that will make me some money, and I'll really think about it and I say, listen, I don't know if you want to do that, and I'm cutting my neck off with this by saying this in the short term, but. I don't know that you want to do that. And these are the reasons that I think this is not a good idea, or at least that you could should you could should consider not doing it. Mm -hmm. While I lose money in the short time, I gain a lot of money in the long term, and personal satisfaction for me goes up too. I love it. It reminds me of Jay Abraham. Uh, and those of you who don't know Jay Abraham, you guys need to get. Uh, to Amazon or Audible and get some of his stuff. He is a phenomenal marketing expert, and he's got a really profound strategy called the strategy of preeminence. And that's really what Patrick's talking about. It's about putting the client's best interest in mind. You don't call them a customer. You call them a client. You have a fiduciary responsibility. You have a duty. You have a moral obligation to get them the highest, best result, not because it's best for you, but because it's best for them. And you do all in your power to steer them in that direction, even if it sets you back financially in the short term because it's best for the client. And I love the fact that you're bringing that to light, Patrick, because uh, without that, you don't really have trust. And without trust, you don't have a long-term relationship. You don't have referrals. You don't have repeat patronage. It's all based on trust. One of the reasons why we uh, provide our solution called the testimonial engine to our clients is because Without trust, there is no sales. And one of the best ways to build that trust is through happy clients sharing the word, sharing the love, spreading the news. And one of the things that you talked about, Patrick, is referrals are an offshoot of that. Plus, happiness. I love the fact you brought that up. Your happiness level increases. Why are we in business? Because we want more happiness. We want more freedom. We want more joy. We want more fulfillment. And if we're dealing with problem child clients that are pain in the neck, that are sucking our juice, that are energy vampires, then we're not happy. So if I'm hearing you right, uh, Patrick, by using this strategy of preeminence, if I can call it that, by seeking out and steering the client in their best interest first and wowing them with first class service, you're not only getting more referrals, but you're having a heck of a lot more fun and fulfillment along the way. Is that right? Absolutely. And I've gotten to a point in my life that, you know, my day is as much about what do I want to do today that one, will bring me joy and two, will bring up my clients joy and those that are on my team that work with me. How can we make this a joyful process? Mm -hmm. So life can be miserable or life can be joyful and I'm going to select those things that do that are going to bring joy to me and to others. I love it. Leave a wake of joy. Be a conduit of joy. It's a beautiful image. So speaking of that, you mentioned earlier that it's really about giving value and 
you insinuated that it's really about building that trust by giving value first, and that's one of the ways you can differentiate yourself. So how do you stay in touch with your leads, with your prospects, and with your past client database to, and bring value first as opposed to just show up and ask for referrals or just show up and you know ask for the sale? What are you doing to uh, bring that value first so they're naturally inspired to bring business to you? So I want to really get to know my clients. And then what I'm going to do is when something is important to them, um, then I want to reach out to them. So let me give you a couple of examples. Let's say, and I just have a handful of really great clients. Let's say, well, more than a handful, but let's say that, um, one of the first things I'll do is I have a Google search that goes on for every one of my important clients so that if they ever come up in the news or if something comes up about them, I can then write to them because I don't read the newspaper and I don't watch TV. I can then, you know, send them off a quick note saying congratulations on that award or, you know, wow, you're really rocking. I'm so happy how you're donating your time to this charity. That's really impressive. You know, that's, one, making them be seen and that it's not just uh, um, some sort of template sort of reaction. The other thing is, is that I like to do is that I like to know what their interests are so that I can do something that really brings value to them. So let's say their kid plays lacrosse and that's really important to them. Mm -hmm. If there's going to be some sort of great event in the metropolitan New York area for a lacrosse event, let's say, Johns Hopkins is coming up to play uh, a team in the area because, you know, Johns Hopkins and Maryland usually have great teams, then to get them tickets for that event uh, for, 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 for the person and, and their son. That is a way of them, again, seeing that I really recognize what's important to them and that I value them. And it's, there's nothing cookie cutter about it. You know what I love about that? It's creating a unique, extraordinary experience as opposed to giving them, you know, a gift card to Home Depot or, you know, a gift card to Starbucks. You're giving them a unique experience that every time they, while they're in the experience, they're thinking about you and reveling in the fact that you help to create and orchestrate that experience. But also in the afterglow of it, when they're remembering that unique experience, it's connected to you. There's a positive association. There's positive emotion anchored to you. I love that because... At the end of the day, that makes you irreplaceable and indispensable because you're you're uplifting their life in a way that is, as you say, it's not replicatable, duplicatable. It's very unique and customized. So I love let, that. And let me also say, when you do something that uplifts another's life, you also end up uplifting your own. That the act of doing it uh, brings you to to a place that is going to make you happier. So that giving is a process that in a way is very selfish because it makes me feel so good. Get this, every day local prospects are searching for your products or services online and they're looking for someone they can trust. Are you capturing that business? How would you like to dominate the local search results with more five-star rate reviews than any of your competitors so you become the only logical, trusted choice? I call it Operation Domination. Download a free copy of our Ultimate Testimonial Toolkit now at mytestimonialengine.com forward slash domination. Again, that's mytestimonialengine.com forward slash domination and discover how to build your business at the speed of trust. It reminds me of one of the, my, my favorite strategies that I get real estate agents and uh, mortgage professionals doing, and it actually can apply to a lot of different business models, is the, what I call the workplace wow, where after you do the transaction, provided, of course, your economics can sustain this, which most can, sending a gift basket to the client's workplace with a big plume of helium balloons, so it causes a commotion in the workplace. Everyone's raving about you and saying, like, what happened? Is it your birthday? What's going on? No, I just did a transaction with ABC. Are you kidding me? When I did a transaction with, you know, these people, they didn't do jack, you know, tell me what's their number, right? And so it creates that extraordinary experience and it naturally gets people talking about you. So when you do this wow factor kind of delight and excite approach, it naturally gets people wanting to refer. Have you found that to be true? Absolutely. 
Very cool. Now you mentioned in passing, you don't watch TV, you don't read the news, nor, nor do I. I. I'd much prefer to be empowered than informed. Uh, and I've been that way for a long time. My wife and I have been that way for a long time. But I'm curious, why don't you uh, watch TV or read the newspaper? What's your motivation for that? Because that's kind of odd. It's kind of unique. It's kind of weird nowadays. Most people are plugged into that crap. So why don't you do it? Well, number one, get over it. Number two, um, uh, what happens? So newspapers these days and television shows about the news are all fear-based organizations. Their goal is to get you to either buy a subscription or come back and view their show again so they can increase their ad dollars. Mm -hmm. They do that almost entirely by creating fear within you. So your reality then becomes based on fear about, oh, what's gonna happen if, you know, Iran attacks uh, a ship out in the uh, out in the sea. What happens if um, you know Trump's elected or Hillary's elected? What happens? It's all fear-based, and and living a life that's fear-based doesn't work, or at least it doesn't work for me. So let me let me give you a really hyper example. Um, back after Lehman Brothers fell in New York. Um, uh, our, the real estate market died. It just died. There were no deals going on whatsoever. No buyers were calling up. It was it was really lousy. And um, so we did a couple of things uh, on my team. The first thing we did was I had a conversation with everybody. And I said, listen, I want you to stop listening to the news altogether for the next 30 days. And I want you to stop reading the newspaper for the next 30 days because it's affecting your perceptions of what life is like. Mm -hmm. I want you to, when another uh, person enters your, your space, another real estate broker, and they're being very negative about the market, you have three options. I want you to see if you can gracefully change the subject If they don't want to have to change the subject, then I want you to leave the room. And number three, if you don't want to do either of those two things, then I want you to leave my team. And then we talked about with our team about how we um, how we had to, you know, cut down on our expenses because no money was coming in and how we had to be very specific uh, about I was very transparent about what my costs were and what my expenses were and everybody volunteered to cut their commissions at the time so that we didn't have to fire anybody. And then finally, uh, we went to all of our sellers with the same transparency and given them options. Should we rent? Should we reduce the should we reduce their sales price by about 12 percent? And what happened was I was in a firm at that time that had about 150 agents. No, they had 250 agents. And in the month of that month of October, um, the entire firm did 12 deals of which my small team did eight of those 12 deals. And the reason we did eight of those 12 deals is we weren't allowing the news media, we weren't allowing other people's opinion affect our reality and how we saw the world and the opportunities that were there. Wow. What an inspiring testimony to the power of not allowing yourself to be conformed to this world, not allowing yourself to be conformed to the news, to the common mindset. You know, I have a, a favorite saying, it's this, if you want extraordinary results, you can't afford to think like ordinary people think. And this is a perfect, stunning, gleaming, sparkling example of that. Uh, I love the fact that you're okay with being weird, you know, like, hey, <laughs> Well, yeah. I've, I've been weird for a long time. So yeah, that's... you might as well just embrace it and not only embrace it, but pour gasoline on the fire with it. I love the fact that you have built a culture on your team and your company and your organization where you get them also okay with being weird. Not only okay, but they pursue it. Everyone else is zigging, you're zagging, and you're creating a culture of winners. And if they aren't willing to conform to that culture of winners, then they leave. They get expelled through the centrifugal force of your culture, your success culture. And I love the fact that you start leading by example, tightening tightening your own belt under that pressure and say, okay, we got to do whatever we got to do to survive the storm. You lead by example. They all follow. You're all in it together as a team. Uh, I can imagine that 
really unified your team, solidified your team, and made you stronger as a team going through that storm. Is that accurate? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was really fascinating to watch how, you know, I was. I, I had little fear around doing that, um, but I knew I had to do it. So uh, we went ahead, and and the team was much tighter after we made those steps. Uh, and one reason is because we didn't have to let anybody go. We were able to keep everybody, and we were able to turn it around really quickly. I've got to say, um, um, so that there wasn't really much of a hardship in the long term. It seemed like it was going to be, but it really wasn't. And um, uh, it was one of the best lessons that I've learned for myself on how to lead others. I love it, love it, love it. Uh, there's a verse in the Bible that says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And uh, you, what you think about comes about. You, th you focus on lack, you fa focus on scarcity, you focus on fear, guess what you get more of? More of the same, right? And that, you get that. That's why you live by that. And that's why you focus on goodness and wholesomeness and uh, success and what you want as opposed to what you don't want. But most people, they allow these weeds to just crop up in their garden and they don't pull them out. They don't uh, enforce any kind of scrutiny. They just allow anything that comes into their mind to just crop up like weeds in their garden. And guess what? Weeds, if you leave them, what do they do? They will take your freaking garden. They will take your garden. So if you want to have operation domination with your business, it starts with your mindset. You can't think like a chump. You've got to think like a champ. And that means you've got to have champ thoughts and you've got to have champ associations and champ programming. So I love the fact you brought that. You, you just you know mentioned it in passing, but that is a huge piece of the puzzle. Huge. So thank you for that. Wow. We, we've already uh, covered... Uh, so much ground in terms of time, but there's so much more I'd like to ask you. Let me ask you a couple more questions real quick. Sure. How do you increase your average ticket price? You talked about that earlier in terms of your journey, the fact that you, you kept scaling up, you kept uh, setting your sights higher in terms of more affluent clientele and bigger ticket items. But let's say uh, a you know, audience member right now is listening to that and they've got some fear about it. They've got um, maybe some confusion around it. And so they like the idea of making more and earning less and, and taking that shortest path to the cash. But there's a bunch of blocks that are holding them back, uh, namely mindset and lack of clarity as to execute that. Anything you can provide that kind of person to help them break through those blockades? Um, I believe it probably comes down to some of your own beliefs about is the world abundant and is the world going to look out for me or, or do I need to protect myself? And if you believe that the world is full of abundance, that there's enough out there for all of us, that even if something in the short term doesn't work out, that I'm still going to be taken care of, then taking those steps are not as risky, so to speak, because your mind's already, I'm going to be okay. Um, mm. Regardless of this is a success or not. I'm mm. going to be okay because I know how to make money. Mm -hmm. And if, if you believe the opposite, that there's a limited amount of resources out there, that there's not enough to go around um, for everyone, then you're going to have a different result. You're, pro you're going to get back what you're putting out in the world. And um, it probably won't succeed, and you'll put yourself through a lot of stress. Now, how do you go about changing those beliefs? Um, at first, I think you need to be conscious about what the beliefs are. And then, and, and once you're conscious, then you can be in choice, and then you can change. Mm -hmm. I've found that um, one of the best ways to be conscious of them isn't necessarily knowing the belief. So often, they're inconspicuous, and they're slippery. They're stealthy. Um, but when there's this negative emotion that keeps cropping up that stops me, that it's like an emotional wall. That's when I know there's a limiting belief, right? So that's, we, that's really, that's a really well said, Dorn. That's really well said that you can't always, you're not always aware that there's something there, but this keeps on like going, why is this coming up again? Why is this coming up again? Why do I feel scared or angry at this time? And mm -hmm. then if you try to look underneath of that. If you look under the fear, if you look underneath of the anger, you'll be able to see, oh, there's a pattern here and this is what it's about and it happens each time X, Y, or Z comes in my life. Bingo. And I've found that our results in life will rarely exceed that which we believe we're capable and worthy of. 
and our results in life will rarely exceed the quality of our routines. So if we want to upgrade our results, we've got to upgrade our routines. And I found personally, I don't know about you, Patrick, but I found personally one of the most powerful ways to transform my beliefs is affirmations and visualization and education. Absolutely. Amen, amen, and amen on all three. But I mean, we know it to think about it, but if we don't embed it into our daily routine, it ain't going to happen. So that's why I'm a big fan of before I get into the saddle with work, I'm you know, working out, I'm listening to educational stuff that inspires me, that motivates me, that gets me feeling pumped. It's like rocket fuel for my entrepreneurial rocket. And then I do a little visualization, just like eight, nine minutes before I start work, a little affirmation, like two minutes before I start work. I, I give myself a cold shower in the morning, not because I enjoy it, but because it conditions myself to feel the fear, to feel the pain and say, screw it, let's do it, no pain, no gain, and to condition myself to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And uh, I found that's huge for, you know, growing my cojones in the face of fear and say, I'm not going to shrink back to fear. I feel the fear and I say, I'm, I'm here. I'm ready. I'm going to pierce through it. It's the only thing in the universe that gets smaller the closer, we're, closer we move to it. So uh, listen, listen, I, uh, I saw your I went you. I saw your pictures on Facebook of, of you and your wife. That's the reason you're taking a cold shower in the morning because I saw pictures of you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I never get work done otherwise. So you have no <laughs> That's right. Although after four kids, I'll, I'll tell you, things change a little bit. I, I'm just glad for grandparents so we could actually have a little bit of, uh, you know, I could get lucky once in a while. We, you know, we could take the whiffy out for a little date. And everything, all, all, of a, all of a sudden the sparks start flying again. But uh, yeah, the cold shower comes in handy for that too. I'll tell you, shrinkage is necessary sometimes so I can get some work done. So um, one last question. You put on this uber successful industry event and most people on the outside looking in would say oh, an event that's for someone else. Uh, that's what other people do. That doesn't fit my model. That doesn't fit my business. That doesn't fit my situation. But if you think about it, I mean, no matter what you sell, no matter what you offer, education is one of the most powerful ways to attract clients. Uh, and whatever your clientele is, education, useful, relevant, valuable content can be one of the most powerful magnets to attract them. So here you are, you put on this educational event for real estate professionals and for you know the top performers and the luxury agents and all this. Uh, and that principle can apply to almost every business model to bring clients in the door and to attract a following and build a herd. So how how did you get into that? How did, how did you make that work? What are the essentials to making that work? Because there are so many different ways to make that not work. There are so many ways to lose your shirt or just have a real, you know, bona fide failure in terms of no one showing up and having all this uh, expense and having it be a waste of time and energy. So what are the essentials? What have you found to make that actually work? All right. This is not this is not a coherent answer. All I can tell you is that. I really thought that I could do it and that I wanted to do it. Mm. I, I didn't, I don't, I still don't have an end game with regards to this. I really don't. I, uh, I, I'm making a really nice profit on it now, but the first year I barely broke even. Um, and everybody even had to chip in a little extra so I could break even. And uh, the second year I made like 17,000. The next year it's keep on, it keeps on going up. Um, and, the point is, is I wasn't doing this to make money. I was doing this because I wanted to do it. And when your heart's there and you're looking at not only is how can I make this an effective business, but how can I really service those other agents who, who I feel like there was a need for what I was offering? How can I do that that's really good for them that will bring me joy to. Hmm. And, and that's really been my, my whole, at least in the last 10 years, that's been my whole approach to life. And it's interesting, you know, um, to your listeners right now, Doran, is that I find that successful people are curious. Hmm. So they're listening on a, your podcast right now they've already shown curiosity because they want to learn more. They want to figure out other ways of doing things. And one of the things of, of, of real brilliance is, is taking something like an idea from another market 
that could be a low-end market, a high-end market, doesn't make any difference. And how can you tweak that idea? Because it's a great idea for them. How can you tweak it and make it work in your marketplace? And that's where curiosity comes in place. So don't be dismissive of new ideas. Just go out there and say, oh, this intrigues me. How can I make this work? Absolutely. You know, the, the, low, producer, the low producers, the mediocre majority, they'll say, I, that won't work. Or I, I can see how that wouldn't work. I can see all the different ways wh- why and how that would, would not work. The top producers, the elite, the, the people who are in the top 1% of any industry, they just flip it on its head and they say, how can I make it work? That's all they do. They, they shift the question, better quality question, better quality answer. How can I make this work? How can I serve more people at a higher level and bring more joy at the same time? And you're a living embodiment of that. So... Uh, I'm very inspired by uh, what you've done, and uh, kudos to you, man. I- I'm stoked to to see the trajectory that you're going to continue to go on as you live by that principle of bringing value to others and bringing joy to yourself. It's a beautiful combination. Awesome. Thanks for having me on, Doran. Yeah. How can people – thank you so much for being with us. How can people link up with you? Let's say they they really uh, enjoy the connection. What's What's the best way to reach out to you? Uh, if you want to, uh, if you want to uh, find me for speaking or one of those needs, go to patricklilly.com. That's L-I-L-L-Y, patricklilly.com. If you're interested in my real estate, it's patricklillyteam.com. And follow me on Twitter at Patrick Lilly or uh, Facebook, which is uh, Patrick Vernon Lilly. All right. So patricklilly.com, Patrick Team. PatrickLillyTeam.com. PatrickLillyTeam.com. Those are the two domains. And, of course, uh, you also have that podcast as well. So anyone who wants to get linked in with more goodness from Patrick Lilly through that podcast, the podcast is Real Estate Success Rocks. Is that right? Yeah, and, and uh, the, yeah, you get to realestatesuccess.rocks instead of .com, or you can go to repodcast.rocks either way. But go to PatrickLilly.com. It can take you to everything. Beautiful. Well, thanks again. I really appreciate your contribution today. That's all for now, my friends. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Local Domination Podcast, your ultimate guide to get local clients fast. So if tips galore that help you soar is what you adore, know this, we've got more in store. Remember, nothing happens without implementation. So in the meantime, in between time, go forth, engage, It's time for Operation Domination.